Welcome, everybody. Just what a joy it is to gather in the house of the Lord to thank him, to praise him, and just to rejoice in the fellowship of the common bonds of salvation that we have through his son, Jesus Christ. Uh, the opening passage of scriptures is found in Psalms. It's the shortest chapter in the Bible, of course. Uh, it's Psalm 117. But in it, it's an amazing psalm because it talks about us Gentiles or the nations of the world. And here in the midst, way back in the book of Psalms, God reminds us that he has a purpose for us. And here it says in the word, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Law him, all you people. For his mercy, kindness is great towards us. And his truth of the Lord endures forever. And Psalm uh, 118 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good and his mercies endures forever. Hallelujah and thank you for your mercies endures forever. Uh, we don't have to worry about salvation, Lord. It's all in your hands, and we thank you that you, you did an amazing miracle and coming. And as we hear this in the songs that we sing to, to uh, those you have brought back from health, like Denise and, and Mel, and uh, we just thank you that, that uh, we can rejoice in the fellowship of singing together in the Lord and hearing the message that you have from the person you have to give us to remind us just how important you are to us, Jesus. And we thank you in your precious name. Hallelujah. Amen. Um, you know, preachers, when they begin to prepare a series, so I have a series that I've been doing on the, the wonder of God's love for me. And I, well, I struggled this week with the one that I was working on. I spent a lot of time on it, a little more than, uh, than, than uh, I have in the past and wrestled with it along the way. And finally... Finally completed it uh, yesterday uh, evening and, and uh, tucked it away, uh, rehearsed it a time or two, things like that. And then this morning I got up and, and I got a little checked, uh, not the message for today. Uh, so uh, if you'll, you'll excuse me, I do, but I do have a message, <laughs> so don't get up and walk away. We're not moving right to the music program right now, as nice as that was. <laughs> so. But I, but I did think about one of the elements. I read the story of uh, Morris Westmacott, who was a part of this church, started it, uh, you know, 40 years ago, 38 years ago, I believe it was. And, and, uh, and I, I know Morris, love Morris as, a, as a, such a great man of God, was at his funeral and, and, and relished the, uh, the accounts from his family members uh, who have that. But, but Morris was supremely... Um, one of those guys who understood that the Church of the Nazarene was born and, and, and raised up as, a, as what we call a holiness church. Uh, that we, did, we just think it's, a, it's important that you live a life that's different than the people in our world. That we live a life that is tuned to what it is that God wants for us. And so I, I, I felt like I wanted to share with you a, a message on that. And I think we've got it up here. Christ-like, setting your heart on things above. And this is a little definition of what a Christ-like disciple is. Uh, was compiled by a group of uh, a group of us preachers at one time when we were talking about it's not enough to simply just use a title on there. What does that mean? A Christ-like disciple is one whose encounter with Jesus has so captured them that they cooperate with the Holy Spirit in reordering their lives to more fully love God and others. I think that's a pretty good summary. I want to draw your thoughts then to Colossians. It's such a rich book. And it was written by Paul, of course, to the church in Colossae. And, uh, and uh, it appears that, in that uh, the church at that time had been visited by a lot of uh, teachers who, who were teaching a particular uh, focus on things, but they were, they were false. They, tr they, they tried to convince these Colossian people that it was all about regulations and rules and following things uh, and convincing them that that was the important thing to do. And uh, that if they were going to live for, a, if they're going to find a way to live a moral life, that they're going to have to do it by just following all of those. And so, so Paul comes fresh from having written his letter to the Ephesians, and, and he begins to share with them the importance of this, of, of what it means to be somebody who, as, as the definition said, cooperates with the Holy Spirit in reordering our lives to more fully love God. So if you have your Bibles, uh, let me read to you from the first 17 verses of, of Colossians chapter 3. Since, since then, since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above and not on earthly things. 
For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self and its practices and have put on a new self which is being renewed in the knowledge and the image of the Creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has grievances against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And above over all of these virtues... Put on love, which binds them all together in unity, and let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, since as members of one body you are called to peace and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another as you, um, with all wisdom, through psalms, hymns, and songs of the Spirit, singing to the God with gratitude of your heart. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him. What I see in here is several movements of sorts. It, it, the reality of this, this matter of being a Christ-like follower, a desire to have something more in my life, is, is first of all, it's all about desire. You can't get much plainer than what he says here in these first four verses. Since you've raised, your, you raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not earthly things. Setting your things, fixing yourself, uh, your, your idea. Fill your thinking with the thoughts of Jesus. And now the word that is used there for thinking isn't just simply you know, a momentary thing. It's, it's make it a habit, a, a regular kind of a routine that you fall into of, of just uh, beginning in the morning and going through the day and then uh, uh, just at the last thought at night. Make it about that. You see the Colossians of, G, uh, uh, of Paul's day, um, that it, it taught, taught them nothing. Their religion taught them nothing about how to live a moral life. You went to a temple someplace, you bowed down to an idol, you left an offering, and then you went right back into the same lifestyle that you had before. The same brokenness that was there before, the same uh, attitudes and behaviors and things like that. If, you're, if they were going to live a righteous and upright life, they're going to have to get their mind off of the things in their life and onto something that is better. Now understand, when Paul's writing to the Colossians, these are believers. That they've clearly brought Christ, uh, bought into Christ's kingdom and they have been raised with Christ. But in chapter 1, uh, verse 13 of this particular book, Paul testifies to the fact that they, have not been, that, they, that they have been redeemed from the darkness and into Christ's kingdom for he has rescued you from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. And he continues to remind them of that all the way through these verses. Uh, that that they, 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 they have this desire to, to know more and to be better. But it's also habits that have instilled into their life. And uh, I like the way uh, Henry King says, to love fully, Christian perfection is to love fully, taking place or trans, taking the place or transforming those affections previously seated on other things now are seated on God. <clears throat> I love the fact that as I have had opportunity in the work we have done over the years with uh, people wrestling through addictions and those things, we've, we've discovered that, that we, we ask them to replace that addiction need they have for this with, a, with an understanding and a need for a living God. And Paul is wanting to say those things. Now, there's a paradox here, though. Uh, it's evident that what Paul is saying in the Colossians and elsewhere, on one hand... Our salvation, our sanctification is an act of God. It's obtained by faith on the basis of what Jesus did for us. But on the other hand, there is something we are also called to do. Now those of you who are parents, you understand that on, on the day that child is born, 
You move from being simply a husband and a wife to becoming parents. It's a biological fact. But we also know that from that point, you're going to make choices that will determine whether or not you're going to be a good parent or, or a poor parent. And the, the biological act of simply giving birth does not necessarily mean that you're going to be a, a good parent. We have to, it's by what we do. And God gave us that responsibility to raise children right. And so, so with sanctification. We're born into this holy kingdom through the death and resurrection of Jesus on our behalf. But that's not the end of the story. We have, a, we have to desire more. A wholeness. That's what holiness is. Dallas Willard uh, states this. I like it when he says, A fundamental mistake is to take as our basic goal to get as many people as possible ready to die and go to heaven. We, why not try to get as, heaven into as many people as we possibly can? Why not help them to live full, meaningful lives in this world? It's about desire. It's also about dedication. And I see this in uh, verses 5 to 11. The, the end goal of every disciple is to be like their master. Uh, the, our, our, our theme, if you would, or our mission statement as a denomination is to make Christ-like disciples of the nations. The, the root word for disciple is discipline. They're, they're related. Becoming a disciple means taking a certain amount of discipline. Now, now the desire that I talked about at first, in uh, my first point, pr produces an inner determination that we need to fulfill this calling in our life. And, uh, and Paul then uses a couple of interesting terms here. He uses the term died as a stark reminder that there are some things in discipline that we have to give up and, and put aside and remind us that there is a put to death things that are going to pull us down and, and that are going to get in the way of, of us living a fuller life. In verse 7, he instructs us to get rid of those things. Now, when, when Audrey and I were, uh, were at college as a young couple just getting our training, we lived in, a, we lived in Winnipeg at our college, was out in the kind of the country field area and and uh, at wintertime in Winnipeg, the mice were smart enough to know they needed to find a warmer place to live. And so usually they'd walk, they'd find a way into the college. And we were in our little, uh, in our little unit uh, there in the college. And, and, uh, and, and we, we ended up with, with a, a mouse in our house, if you could say that part. Now, the fact of it is that uh, uh, Audrey, uh, Audrey and mice do not make a good combination. Now, I'm not a fan of them either, but for her, it's a matter, it's, you know, I don't want it here at all. And so it's up to me. I, I, in fact, I should say, when I first met her one time, she asked me to get something out of her purse, and I go in there and look, and I say, what do you have a mouse trap in here for? And so she, and she said, well, I used to do camp ministries and stuff like that. I can never go to sleep unless I set the trap for that most someplace along the way. So you know, that's, this, is, this is pretty urgent. And, and so uh, in the midst of this, it was a matter of where, uh, where's my job to get rid of, uh, of the mouse. And, uh, the, uh, and, and so I, I did, but, but sadly I had to kill it to get rid of it. So, so what do you think I did with that dead mouse? I didn't put it on the shelf. <laughs> So that I could, when everybody came by, I'd say, let me tell you about the story of the hunt for that mouse, you know. <laughs> I didn't do that. I didn't put it in Tupperware so I could keep it fresh <laughs> on the way. Every woman would say, yeah, yeah. So, uh, I didn't hang it off the mirror in my car so I'd be a tribute, a trophy of sorts on that. I threw it out. We, we didn't want it in the house when it was alive. We certainly didn't want it in the house when we were dead. And, and that's what Paul's saying. Get rid of those things that once pulled you down and destroyed your life. And in verse 9, he uses the term putting on and taking off, which according to uh, the commentary would say that, that would have been a catchphrase for the people reading this particular account along the way in the Colossae who, uh, who would especially have reminded, that to them would be a reminder of the day when they had gone for their baptism, when they had come down to the, to the river with their clothes that, that commemorated their old lifestyle and they would place them down and they would with their new garments go into the water and be baptized. They would put off the old and they would put on the new. And he is saying you, you want to put off Note the, the list he gives here. You want to put off those things that are centered on the self, on me, what I want. 
sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language. Instead, he said, you want to put on compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. If we are to be a holy people, then we are going to be able, need to have our lives that are shaped and molded by these things, to be centered on what Christ wants. One author writes this, it is, found present, it, it, it is found in presenting all of myself to God, all of my days of my life, and learning to love God with all of my heart and strength and to love my neighbor as myself, and then validating it by how we live out this life. Thirdly, it's about dependency. Discipling, rightly understood, is personal. But it's not individual. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit, but if, if we learn anything from Acts and the accounts in the New Testament, Christ-like disciples are those who are learning to grow through the influence of others and other resources. See, we need help to live holy lives. Through my preparation for this message, I thought about how many holy relationships, these holy relationships are a lot like marriage. Uh, I like this statement that comes from Mildred Weinkoop where she said, love mature, cannot mature without expression. Love cannot mature without expression. There's, there's kind of an already and not yet element to this whole matter of married life. It's, remember? It, it, it's, an all, it's a pretty all-consuming feeling and emotion during the time of, uh, of dating. There's nothing static about that period of, uh, of time in your life. And, and a time comes when, when we have an event. An event is called a wedding. And on that day that Audrey and I got married, I went from being her fiancé to being her husband. We went from being, having just good intentions to the legal status as Mr. and Mrs. Dole. In the eyes of the province and in the eyes of the church and in the eyes of the witnesses, some of whom were a little surprised that she really went through with this after all. <laughs> but but it, would, it would be a foolish person who would simply say that, that just by that legal act, act it is finished. It would be silly have to, to, for me to have said to Audrey at the reception as we're there, you know, I, honey, I got, my, my best friends came for the wedding and are, are here. These are, these are my buddies along the way. And... and and uh, we've decided that we're going to take a couple of days and go fishing. Uh, can, you, can you get to the apartment okay? That would be a death warrant. <laughs> That's not a smart thing to do, right? Not the thing you would do. But of course, and it wasn't what I wanted to do. I love my good friends, but I desire and love my wife. The wedding was great, but that wasn't the end of the story. That we might become the righteousness of God. We also recognize, don't we, that in a good relationship it requires a measure of dedication, a ter determination to make things work. That there are going to be times and moments within a life when, when, uh, when we don't think the same way and we have differences of opinions or, or uh, those things. You'll recall I mentioned my piece of advice to young marriage, you know, that marriage is death. You know, someone who's going to have to die to who keeps the window open or whether it stays shut, those kind of things. But we don't, see, we don't see those things as negative, but as a positive statement about the value that we have uh, for one another. And so when I have, uh, to me that means so much in a wedding ceremony when I say those words to that couple to say, and forsaking all others and being true to you alone means in all of this world, all others are secondary to you. And again, we don't see that as a negative thing, but a positive statement of ongoing affection and affirmation and dedication to the person, to the institution of marriage. I'm also aware that good marriages that last and provide a good model have spent a lifetime making changes for the goodness of the relationship. We, we do things differently. <laughs> you know, anytime I meet with couples and I say, so are you different? Oh, yeah, you know, and, and then they start talking about that. When Audrey and I did this, uh, uh, you know, it started into ministry along the way, someplace in there we, we did this thing that was called the Taylor Johnson Temperament Analysis. 
And it was interesting to find out just how different we are. She's active social. She enjoys going to events like plays and music. And, and I'm, I'm on the other hand, I'm not antisocial, didn't say that, uh, but it's what they call quiet, which means given the choice of going someplace or staying, I'll, I'll stay home, thanks, that's good. But there are times when I will go with her because it's an area, uh, not because it's necessarily an interest that I have in that particular piece of music or those, that event, but because I'm interested in her. And there are times when she will say, you don't have to come if you don't want to. And we have those kinds of uh, things, this, this, you know, t finding ways in which we manage and make do with those things. And it, it also means as well that uh, I, I, I am, by the way, uh, on that scale. She's high in the area of management, planning, detailing. I'm at 5% on that size. <laughs> They call it impulsive. Uh, some call it irresponsible. Uh, but given the choice, I'd, you know, I'd, I'd, I'll wait until the offering time to decide what we're going to do. Uh, those kind of things. So you can tell there would be tension on that. Uh, she didn't want to show up someplace, you know, 10 minutes late. Uh, so, we have to, so we had to make adjustments on that uh, to where I'd say, yeah, I need, you know, for the sake of her, I need to do it. It's better. I'm a better person because of those things. And so as we've continued in those years of marriage, I'm, I'm interested. We're, we're almost at 50 years, and we're still finding out new stuff about each other along the way. We, we're going to need help living a holy life, so let me give you simply three things. I need God's help to live this life. Uh, Keith Drury's definition of sanctification is simply this. Sanctification is everything God does to make us more like Christ. Throughout his letter to the Colossians, Paul emphasizes the powerful role of, of God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, in shaping and making us, just as God did a work for us in reconciling ourselves to him, so he does this work in us, with the objective of helping us to become all we can be. Time and again, the good word reminds us that God is at work on our behalf, for his kingdom's work. I need a holy community. I'm not surprised that Denise missed you and this family. She referenced it almost in every text and email uh, that she sent, I miss my family. No, we need that kind of thing. And, and a few weeks back, you'll recall, I had the opportunity to go back to my home church and share with them. And I, and I thank them for holding me to a standard that was higher than what I thought I could do or needed to do. They had an expectation. I needed that community to walk alongside of me. And you do that. The church is a, is a body of faithful believers, of disciples, of followers. And, and, uh, and it is so, uh, I like what how P Eugene Peterson says it in the, mis in, the minis in the message. Let the peace of Christ keep you in tune with each other, in step with each other. None of this going off and doing your own thing. <laughs> I need, thirdly, his word in my life. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, it says in verse 16. And in a way, we're kind of back where we started in this passage of Scripture, setting your heart on things above. We believe in the written word of God is sufficient to guide and direct us in this whole matter of our walk and our journey. The Trinity is our model, you know, this Holy, the God, the this Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit work in harmony. In fact, there's whole books written about how this comes together. And I, I think of it sometimes, it's a, I referenced it to say, they almost want to say it's like a dance where, where your moves are coordinated together to become something of a beauty. And I know this, that it is only with God's help that we can follow and live and journey in this life together. Father, I come before you and I pray for the hearts of these, your people. We desire, dear Father, to be more than we are, better than we are. Uh, we, we seek, O oh Father, to find peace in the midst of the journey that sometimes seems confusing. But help us, dear Father, to be those people that live in this world tuned to your heart most of all. May you work in harmony with our hearts and souls. 
to lead us and guide us, to bless us, and to let us become a blessing for others. I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And now, O oh Father, we come before you thankful for this beautiful day, a gift indeed. For a reminder as we leave this place that Christ is risen. And that you walk with us, that you are personal to us, to come alongside us. I pray, Father, that you would let us walk into this world to be the people of God in this world, that they would see indeed the compassion, the grace, the faith of your people. Bless each one, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you.